Thank you everyone for joining us. Um, we know you had a lot of choices for publishing related sessions in this time slot, and so we appreciate you coming to ours. Um, we're going to do some more thorough introductions in a minute, but just really quickly so you know who you're looking at. We have, I'm Melanie Schlosser, I'm the Community Facilitator for the Library Publishing Coalition and the Scholarly Communications Program Leader at the Educopia Institute. Um, we've got Catherine Mitchell from the California Digital Library, Charles Watkinson from the University of Michigan, and Joshua Nets Fox from Wayne State. Uh, so this is what we called our presentation and what it says in the program, this is what we realized we should have called our presentation when we really started working on it. Um, we're going to use this idea of sticky interdependence to talk about the development of a shared culture and shared infrastructure in the library publishing sphere. Uh, let's see. This is meant to be an actual panel discussion rather than a series of individual presentations. So I'm gonna give some brief introductory remarks. Um, we're gonna give each of our panelists uh, no more than five minutes to introduce themselves, their programs, uh, and very briefly the platforms that each of them are developing. And then we're gonna spend the rest of our time uh, discussing a series of three questions. And I'll say a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, we will, of course, leave some time at the end for questions or for a wider discussion with you all. So to set the scene, I'm going to really quickly highlight four trends uh, to, I think, provide some important context for this. None of this is going to be new, but I think it's all important to keep in mind uh, as we're having this discussion. The first one is consolidation of research infrastructure by commercial publishers. Um, hopefully a bunch of you were in the session yesterday with our colleagues from UC San Diego. Uh, Allegra Swift, hi Allegra, uh, did a really great job of laying out the problem in this space. Um, so it's, I'm sure it's not news to you that uh, publishers have been buying up um, pieces of, of the research infrastructure to string together end-to-end -end solutions. Um, and what we are talking about today is a, a portion of libraries' response to that, specifically in the library publishing space. Um, I'm sure none of you would be here if you didn't believe that the challenges involved in creating, providing access to, and preserving digital content are bigger than any one library can tackle alone in a sustained way. Um, you know, one of the ways that libraries have dealt with this is the development of shared community-supported infrastructure. Um, obviously, there have been some uh, challenges that have been highlighted in this recently. Um, the Deepin announcement is one. Um, but I, I still think, I think we all share the belief that um, collaboratively supported shared infrastructure is still one of the most promising ways that libraries can push back against um, over-resourced uh, commercial organizations that are able to purchase or develop um, giant platforms. Uh, this one, uh, academy ownership, this isn't so much a separate trend as it is just a different lens of looking at these same issues. Um, there is increasing interest in returning control of the scholarly communications enterprise to academic institutions. Um, there have been some kind of interesting recent examples. Last year, this event, there was a lot of talk about the 2.5% initiative. Uh, last year's library publishing forum pre-conference on open source publishing platforms also made use of this lens. Um, I'm helping to organize the first academic-led publishing day, which is a distributed digital event that's happening on February 7th. And I'm doing that mostly because I don't think that there's any kind of shared understanding in this space of what we're actually talking about when we say academy ownership, uh, scholar-led, sort of all of these different phrases. Uh, and I don't think we're going to get anywhere until we get a better sense of what problem we're trying to solve uh, and also how we're going to do it. So I'm hoping that um, this conversation is part of a much bigger one about what does that actually look like and how can libraries advance that. Uh, at this point, I think library publishing isn't so much a trend as it is an established role for academic libraries, but I do think it's worth juxtaposing it with that last slide. Um, I was tickled that Cliff Lynch included our session in his um, roadmap email, uh, and I really love that he described library publishing as taking place under the radar. <laughs> Um, yeah, for the most part, the field is made up of practitioners who are just quietly getting things done on their campus, um, which I think is a strength, but it probably means that we have no one to blame but ourselves for the fact that when these discussions about academy ownership come up and, and taking control of the means of production of scholarship, library publishing is almost never mentioned. 
um, which is funny because it's such an obvious fit in a lot of ways. Um, so this session is in part an opportunity to explore what does that look like in a library publishing environment. Uh, and then really briefly about our sticky interdependence theme and the way we're going to use that. Uh, we are going to talk about, we're going to discuss three different questions and three different ways that we see this coming up in the library publishing space. Um, culture alignment and integration, actually let me give you a longer one. Uh, so we're going to talk about the development of a shared culture and values in the library publishing field. The alignment of library publishing efforts with partners both inside and outside of the library to move the needle in crucial areas the development of a distributed but increasingly integrated infrastructure for scholarly publishing in libraries. And finally, the challenge of sustaining collaborative efforts in this area. As first three are gonna get their own discussion topics. The fourth one, sustainability, we're gonna to try to touch on that all the way through. If you don't feel that we've done so adequately, feel free to bring it up in the Q&A. Okay, with all that out of the way, uh, we're gonna give each of our panelists a chance to introduce uh, ourselves, our programs, and our platforms. So, first, Joshua. All right, so it looks like I'm first. Uh, I'm Joshua Nets Fox. I'm at Wayne State University in Detroit, Michigan, and I'm the coordinator for digital publishing in the libraries. Uh, I oversee our publishing efforts, uh, our digital collections, and our institutional repository, and a small team of people. I also work uh, closely alongside uh, Dr. Cheryl Ball. Cheryl is the, uh, one of the leads on the Vega project. Vega is an, uh, is an academic publishing system, primarily uh, configured for web texts. Cheryl, uh, with partner Andrew Morrison at the Oslo School of Architecture and Design, uh, pr uh, proposed this project. It's a uh, Mellon funded and, uh, and it comes out of her work uh, in Kairos, which is the uh, oldest extant uh, scholarly journal publishing multimedia. Uh, it was the first to publish web texts online, and Cheryl's been the editor uh, for something like 17 years at this point. Uh, and the pain points in that uh, publishing process uh, are, the, are the genesis for this project, that publishing multimodal scholarship that may have multiple moving parts and where the frame and structure of the actual web uh, objects is part of the rhetorical argument being made poses uh, unique problems in the peer review and editorial process. And those problems um, require that, uh, that the structures that undergird them be slightly different from the sort of out-of-the-box scholarly publishing uh, infrastructure that's available. And so Vega was designed with what I think are three chief uh, um, advantages uh, or, or points, unique points in mind. One is that the workflow, the editorial workflow uh, of the system is entirely extensible and configurable. And so the stages of the editorial process from submission, uh, you know, you would traditionally think of submission, peer review, copy editing, typesetting, and publication. Those can be expanded or contracted, remixed, changed, new, entirely new structures dreamed up, uh, and, the, and uh, the objects that go through peer review can move through those stages uh, in a configurable manner. Two, the system um, takes uh, advantage of affordances that make it relatively easy to integrate uh, multimedia into the traditional web text or narrative. And so um, it's, it's not difficult to do very simple multimodal web uh, texts in Vega. And three, the, um, the system allows for uh, forms of review that are, that sort of go beyond the um, double blind. And so collaborative review, peer-to-peer -peer review, open review, closed review, those are also available and configurable. And, um, and especially because uh, in Kairos, Dr. Ball's experience was that the editing process is far more collaborative, that authoring structure for multimedia and the review structure are tied together in ways that allow authors, editors, and reviewers to collaborate uh, across the, the life of the project. 
Uh, Vega is um, built in JavaScript in uh, Node with React front end and a MongoDB. And uh, the front end and the back end are loosely coupled via um, API so that in theory, if you had a, a good understanding of the code underneath, you could build multiple heads on the back end of the project. And finally, I should say, uh, point out that Vega's um, structure is such that as um, content is ingested into the system, um, native sort of cruft around it is stripped out and it's restructured so that the data itself is structured and saved as individual nodes uh, so that those pieces are available to other parts of the system should you want to remix or reuse parts of the scholarship. Uh, it's in alpha at the moment at Wayne State um, and uh, 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 in heavy testing and we anticipate a beta launch uh, sometime early to spring next year. Uh, and Do you want the other slide? Yeah, that's, that's fine. <laughs> So this is uh, a, a shot um, detailing s sort of some of the look of various items uh, in stages of the editorial workflow in Vega and, uh, and those items uh, show up as dots so that you sort of know where your um, current uh, list is in the process of um, editing. There's a, a frame for commenting on the right and the bottom is um, series or uh, journal-like structures uh, that can be um, displayed on the front end. Uh, I, I would be remiss if I s did not say that this project started at West Virginia University and has only recently moved to Wayne State, and so uh, credit where credit is due. Okay. I think you. I've said it. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> okay. Um, thanks. I think I will be saying some of the things that Joshua said. <laughs> Um, my name is Catherine Mitchell, and I'm the Director of Publishing and Special Collections at the California Digital Library at the University of California. I'm here to talk about Editoria, which is also a Mellon-funded project. Um, this project, uh, I, I worked closely uh, with Eric Van Rijn um, from UC Press. He and I are co-PIs on this project. And um, the sort of impetus for it was the crisis in the humanities um, with the monograph and its questionable sustainability. And so one of the things that we wanted to do was try to uh, build books better so that they were more efficiently created, um, so that they were less expensively created, and so that they were better tuned, so that the process of making them was better tuned to a digital um, first distribution model and also, but not exclusively, open access. Next slide. Oh, oh, should I do it? Okay. Great. Oops, that is not too far. Okay, this is, these are old slides. All right. Um, I want you to know that I have revised these slides. They are not currently in their revised state. And I revised them because I realized that I was leading initially with what is editoria instead of leading with the problem. And I felt that Cliff Lynch had chastened us enough at the beginning that I should fix that. So now I'm owning up to my mistake and um, proceeding. <laughs> um, so uh, so what, does, what does editoria do to make books better? Well, basically, um, it, there are a couple of things that it does, one of which is to provide library publishers with the capacity to make books. Um, I think that in many cases, those of us who are working in library publishing feel pretty confident about our journal production systems. We have, we're running journals, we have multiple options for running journals, and there's a long history of us hosting journals and supporting journals within our institution and beyond. Um, one of the things that we have not been able to do at CDL, and I think there are probably others in the room who face some of the same challenges, is provide a similarly robust mechanism for making books. But that is not to say that we don't have a, a reason to do that, because in fact we have found at the University of California on the 10 campuses that there are a great many academic units who are actually producing book series. And they aren't doing it with publishers, they're doing it themselves, and they're doing it in very awkward and unwieldy ways. Um, and they would love to have more infrastructure to support that work. And so that was, it was what drove us as the library to be very keen to work on this project. 
Um, Eric came at it from a different perspective as an academic press looking for a way to refine a process that they were already very good at, um, but that felt as if it were mired in, um, in, in some uh, systems that were outdated and no longer well suited to the ways in which they wanted to distribute books, including open access book programs. So, um, uh, so what this offers is basically a consolidation of systems for those entities that have already been publishing books and a way to produce books for those of us who are eager to move into that space and support our institutions in that way and our faculty. Um, it also helps to migrate away from desktop software. Um, you know, there are a lot of examples of people making books in Word, trying to create a PDF, but before they do that, passing the manuscript around to any number of people, losing track of the version, you know, putting extra junk in the code, and then really struggling to get something that's print ready. So the idea was to move out of all of those desktop solutions into a single um, web-enabled environment. And finally, um, to, uh, to create digital workflows that were actually, that would enable in, in much the way that, that Josh was describing, would enable multiple folks, the author, the editor, the peer, uh, the peer reviewer, to work in a system simultaneously as appropriate. <laughs> okay. Back to what it is. So Editoria is uh, an open source browser-based digital book production system. Um, and what it does is it provides um, workflow management tools so that people can basically either, if they're feeling ambitious, author in the system or present us with more typically a Word document that we can then ingest, um, convert to HTML, and then make available for all of the um, design and editorial work that happens within the system. Um, it has, um, it has browser-based editing, so again, there isn't the problem of versioning. Everybody knows what they're working on and where it is in its development. Um, and, and what we're outputting is basically, you know, an EPUB, a PDF, anything you might need can come out of the same work. So it's a single workflow um, with multiple um, outputs. And, um, and it's, it should be easy to implement. It's really been designed from the perspective of book production editors at UC Press. Um, which is interesting because they are a team, they know what they do, and instead of just sort of replicating what they were using before, they sort of broke it down. We worked with COCO, the COCO Foundation, this amazing technology partner um, that doesn't just build things but actually thinks about how people do things and asks them to rethink how they're doing things and what would be the easiest path somewhere. So, um, so it's designed to be very intuitive in that way. Um, and it's currently in beta. Um, I think that one of the interesting things for us is that it's having been designed by academic press production editors, it's very much aligned with how they work. The library press, or the library publishing scenario is a bit different. So we're finding that we have some additional requirements that they may not, um, so that's, that's where we are with that. And then finally, um, well, we have, uh, the, the, the interesting about thing about the technology here, and I will get to it later because I feel like I'm running over, is that um, this is really modular and it isn't a single system. It is the sort of conglomeration of a lot of open source um, efforts that are out there. Um, in addition to the pub suite technology, which is um, JavaScript based and um, customizable. So we're really trying to convene a community of open source effort here rather than building something uh, de novo. And then finally, we have some partners. Um, and um, folks are signing on. They're in the system. They're testing it. They're using it. They're, they're writing requests for um, features. And it's already, we've had a, our first meeting. It's a really lively bunch. People are very excited about it. Um, one of our partners is Fulcrum. On to Charles. Can hand in that? Uh, yeah. Thank you, Joshua. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I'm Charles Watkinson. I'm uh, Associate University Librarian for Publishing, and you should, would have thought I'd work out how to operate. Oh, I get a point to do. There we go. Um, so, uh, Associate University Librarian for Publishing at University of Michigan and Director of University of Michigan Press. Um, and uh, uh, my portfolio, as it were, is University of Michigan Press, Michigan Publishing Services, which is a library publisher, and Deep Blue uh, Institutional Repository. Um, and I'm going to talk about Fulcrum uh, briefly. So uh, Fulcrum is also supported by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. 
Um, Fulcrum is, uh, has very little uh, behind the scenes in terms of workflow tools. It's not, a, it's not an authoring platform, it's not a production platform. Um, it has uh, a particular focus and that is on uh, the durability and preservation of um, book length materials. Uh, so what it consists of is it consists of a, a reading layer which reads EPUB files uh, and underneath um, a repository layer that uh, preserves associated assets and those assets are delivered through the reader layer. So uh, it's a response to uh, a pattern that we've seen with uh, humanities authors which is that they are true digital scholars now, they are collecting a lot, uh, a lot of material during their research and at the point of publication they are wanting to deliver that material with their narrative. So this is a way of um, supporting the production of enhanced e-books and uh, interactive scholarly works um, and doing it in a way that is built on top of a repository layer that is uh, uh, in the Sambara Fedora framework is actually on the same stack as our research data repository at University of Michigan. So really getting back to the point that Cliff Lynch raised in his opening remarks that um, this issue of posterity, of durability, uh, is a major block to uh, scholars who want to move into the digital space with their book length projects. So Fulcrum is really uh, addressing that particular issue. Um, it's uh, it's uh, a hosted platform. Um, it has behind the scenes a number of services um, that uh, we're offering to other publishers. Um, and it does integrate with authoring and workflow tools. So in fact, we're working both with Vega and with Editoria to provide a, a, a content <laughs> workflow. Um, so uh, at this stage, we have uh, a, a, over 6,500 books on Fulcrum, and they're mainly in two collections. Uh, one is the ACLS Humanities eBook collection, and that's a backlist collection of about 5,000 books. And the other one is the University of Michigan Press ebook collection, which launches in January, which launches with about 1,100 books. And then we're also hosting some publications for other publishers, uh, like uh, the Level Press, um, and also uh, working with uh, some other university presses. So this is just an example of an enhanced ebook on Fulcrum. So this is relatively simple. It's um, an EPUB with embedded uh, video. But at the same time, we are moving towards much more complex interactive scholarly works. This is an archaeological report which uh, delivers a 3D model, um, uh, associated data, and narrative in the same environment. It's all in the EPUB3 environment, but you can truly interact with this work. <coughs> and this is just lastly to say, to repeat the, 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 the concept of, uh, I think this feeds into you know, other themes in this uh, presentation, which is the idea of integration. So the way in which these projects really can fit together for one publisher's workflow. And so this is our aspirational but getting there um, workflow for University of Michigan Press. Um, and you can see that, uh, as Joshua has said, we feel that we can use some of the back end of Vega to manage manuscript management and peer review, uh, coming into an editorial workflow where we can manage the production process, uh, delivering through Fulcrum, um, and then offering our content through some other programs like Simply E, for example, for a reader who is trying to get stuff from multiple platforms, including Fulcrum, and also Rebus, which is another Mellon Foundation supported reading. Uh, platform, but also just to make the point that we're all about standards, we're all about integration, we're all about making digital humanities type projects discoverable and preservable by asking for a certain amount of constraint from the faculty who are writing and constructing those. Uh, so it's, it's a bargain. We'll preserve, we'll make your work discoverable if you follow some of our um, workflows and containers. Uh, and I'm not going to introduce another platform to you, uh, that's it, but I do want to give you some quick background on the Library Publishing Coalition for those of you who aren't familiar with it, because uh, it's kind of an important framework around some of the things we're going to discuss 
Uh, LPC is a community-driven membership association of libraries involved in publishing. It's hosted by the Educopia Institute that provides both um, administrative support and also community facilitation. Uh, we released our first strategic plan this year, and as you do, as part of that process, we revisited our vision, mission, and values. Uh, and I'm sharing this with you mostly because um, I think our new vision statement is lovely, and I try to get as much mileage out of it as possible. Uh, our vision is a scholarly publishing landscape that is open, inclusive, and sustainable. So obviously we're aiming high, but I do think it's a, a good articulation of the values of a lot of library publishers and, and the libraries that they're a part of. Uh, and here are just some kind of basic facts about LPC and some highlights for annual activities. We have about 82 member libraries, a number of strategic affiliates, of which CNI is one. Um, our annual conference, the Library Publishing Forum, uh, there's some postcards around, please take one. It's coming up in May in Vancouver. Uh, we also have a really active set of committees and task forces that do amazing work and we're involved in grant funded research projects um, like the, the IMLS project that created the library publishing curriculum. Um, check out librarypublishing.org for lots, lots more information. So with that, we're going to move on to our panel discussion. Uh, so, hang on. Apologies in advance for the overly long and pedantic nature of these questions. They're really more discussion prompts. So, first one, um, one of the reasons for the creation of the LPC in the first place was the need to develop a community of practice around library publishing, which until then was mostly individual libraries working in isolation. Five years in, that community has grown in ways that I think would have been hard to predict in 2013, and one of them has been a strong and growing focus on developing a set of shared values and ethics for the field. Um, so for our three panelists, how have you seen or participated in that, and what impact do you feel it's having both on library publishers and on the broader environment? <laughs> I could start. Uh, um, I, so uh, I was intimately involved in the um, early discussions and then the development um, that led to the uh, ethical framework for library publishing that came out of the Library Publishing Coalition, uh, published earlier this year, is that right? Uh, and it, it grew out of um, discussions at the forum two years ago, um, where we sort of recognized uh, the ethical, the imperative to, to interrogate our own ethics uh, as a, a group. If we really are a community, then what are our values? I think I'm restating your, your premise in this question. Uh, and um, and I think that, that that focus and the document that's come out of it, which, have, which is intended to be a living document revisited um, and revised as, uh, as our understanding of our responsibilities and our ethics grow, uh, that um, is beginning to have impact. Uh, we've seen it used um, in discussions. Uh, so for instance, in the um, Humetrics uh, project, that document was uh, apparently uh, highly relevant to the, to the guiding of, the, of those discussions. Uh, and I, I also think it, it helps inform this sense that we, um, we have uh, responsibilities in the, in the projects that we undertake, the software that we create, the infrastructures that we develop, um, that might be in, that might be informed by more than simply publishing imperatives. Uh, that there are, there may be, that, that it's good to interrogate what our values are as libraries and publishers, uh, so that some of that can go into the, um, the development of the, the work that we're doing. And so, um, not to belabor this, but in the case of Vega, uh, can we acknowledge that um, that questions of new peer review processes or open peer review processes um, help to push against the kind of gatekeeper function that um, closed or traditional peer review might serve uh, against um, values of uh, inclusion or diversity. And thinking about that on the front end makes certain that on the back end you don't find yourself in a situation where you uh, are, are sort of um, locked into a technology that uh, is, runs counter to values <coughs> that you, you, you wish you could support. 
I, mean, I mean, I don't think one, the, the importance of this work by the Library Publishing uh, Coalition can really be overstated. Um, it's incredibly relevant for university presses as well as library publishers. And the idea that we are mission-related publishers, that we are different in something that is a very meaningful way from um, commercial publishers um, is really, it's a, it's a rebirth. Uh, and um, the, uh, it's incredibly important for me. It's also incredibly important, important for our systems. Um, it's been very, very influential working with the Lever Press uh, uh, group as well to sort of hear these values reinforced and reinforced and also working within a library context this is you know this is the environment that we're working and helps us connect with other partners within our own libraries as well um, from a fulcrum point of view uh, fulcrum is is uh, has four design principles that are values-based design principles so one of those for example is accessibility and just what do you what happens if you view what you're doing truly through an accessibility lens uh, goes far beyond a community of uh, partially sighted readers. Uh, for example, it goes right to the heart of how we think about digital um, and the digital affordances and open access and including equity and uh, uh, diversity and so on. So it's, it's, just, it's just these frames of values-based frames really help us to put blue water between where we sit and where a commercial competitor sits and are extraordinarily helpful. I would just add that um, a lot of this work and a lot of this thinking has come out of what are effectively community meetings at the Library Publishing <coughs> Forum. And the first meeting that, that gave rise to the ethical framework for library publishing was a meeting in which we were grappling with uh, a, an environment that suddenly wasn't so much fact-based and thinking about what we could do as a community to, um, to sort of make our ethics known, to, to make sure that voices that seemed more silenced than they had been before would be heard and that um, perspectives that, that were, you know, being explicitly rejected would, would have a, a, a space. And so that was a very, um, I think, a very emotional meeting for, for the group and, and there was a lot of talk. The next year we, we convened around um, the topic of uh, Elsevier's purchase of V Press. And again, there was, you know, there were, there were real ethical quandaries there, you know, B Press works for me, I like it. it, it does what I need it to do. Um, it's owned by a company that um, I believed I was, you know, offering an alternative to by using B Press. And so how do we reconcile those things as a community and having the space to sort of grapple with that and think about what it means for our ethical obligation to each other? Do we allow NDAs with vendors? Um, do, you know, how do we work to um, protect privacy and data when we engage with vendors? You know, can we as a community come up with standards for contractual relationships that will protect people? Um, and then, of course, the academy-supported, um, community-led open, um, open infrastructure that we are all sort of working in and that we want to see more and more of. You know, how can it position itself in a way to make sure that there are alternatives to the kinds of gatekeeping that aren't just about quality but are about certain kinds of voices and, and, and not hearing others? Uh, I, I did want to make one point, which is, um, you know, I'm using commercial as a shorthand, non-commercial versus commercial. I think it's really, really important um, to not suggest that by a, so, you know, certain publishers, by an accident of the tax code, are essentially categorized as commercial, um, but are in fact as mission-driven uh, as, as uh, those of us who are fortunate enough to be non-profit status are. And that's also um, true of uh, uh, many of the vendors in our community, that it, it, this, is not, this is not a divide and it's, it's, an, it's an encouragement to, to embrace an idea of mission-driven and values-based that goes far beyond uh, that division. Before we move on, any thoughts on how the development of a shared culture and values might impact sustainability of these efforts in the long run? Uh, yeah. Well, one thing that comes to mind, uh, again, is this idea that um, 
these these infrastructure platforms, you know, pr presumably they they are of benefit to the whole community. You know, they they don't accrue to, to simply one uh, player or institution. And if that's true, then they are of benefit to small practitioners, you know, who just don't like uh, Catherine says, who don't have the infrastructure to do books, um, but suddenly could perhaps find themselves with that infrastructure. And if that, if the community that gives rise to these projects does is not values, does not have a shared understanding of values, or is not approaching these projects from a, a frame of a particular ethic, then. Um, those small players find themselves again at the at the sort of at the mercy of whatever the ethic is uh, that gets baked into the project. I mean, we all are, understand uh, sort of a, a rising sense that, that the algorithm can be biased. You know, the software can be uh, ethically compromised if it's not developed with a, from an ethical framework. And so it, 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 it is important that as a community we understand what our values are so that those values can inform our development work so that that development does not then um, turn back and betray the people who use it. Anything else? Okay. So moving on to our alignment theme. Um, as we were talking about what we wanted to do with this session, all of you shared a number of examples of ways that library publishers are taking part in larger efforts or are forming partnerships with organizations in different sectors or otherwise aligning their work with others to have a bigger impact. Um, can you talk about where you're seeing that and maybe about where you'd like to see more of it in the future? I'll jump in here. Um, well, first of all, we're aligning ourselves very closely at CDL with our university press, and that's something that we have had, we've tried to do in fits and starts over the years, but we are now going to be on the same technology platform for book production, which is something new, and it enables us to imagine an increasing level of, of uh, sticky inter interdependence and, and opportunity where we could be, you know, involved in some kind of a continuum of book publishing, where it's easier to hand a project off or to sort of imagine it sort of evolving toward another, um, another life with another uh, sponsor, in, in effect. And so that's exciting, and it's nice to see us converging, but also recognizing you know, where we have a shared interest and where our needs diverge. Um, I would say that for us, working with the Coco Foundation has been a really important um, step away from uh, library-based technology. And um, one of the things that we've done historically at CDL is build our own. Um, and when we have participated in open source projects, they have tended to be library-driven. Um, and this is a technology partner um, who has more of a sort of grounding in, um, in the publishing world, specifically um, work on PLOS infrastructure and a, a long history with uh, companies like Highwire, et cetera, the principles of this, of this, um, of the foundation. And so for us, this is really um, an important move toward a, a kind of a, a technology expertise in an area that is not the focus of the library and has been uh, immensely helpful. It's been really interesting to work with different communities of libraries. Um, uh, the, the Library Publishing Coalition is one community, uh, the Lever Press um, group is another community, Amherst, Middlebury, 54 uh, supporting institutions. Um, a very interesting community that we've really had the chance to work with more and more is Lyricis. And um, that's been a fascinating experience. Uh, Lyricis pivoting to become uh, this uh, incubating entity, this introducer connector, and working with the um, you know, members of the 1,000 plus libraries, museums, galleries that are uh, uh, archives that are associated with lyricists has really given us a fascinating opportunity to test our ideas and our technologies in a variety of different contexts. So that's been a really fascinating community and a very promising uh, and pivotal partner in our work on sustainability, I think. Um, uh, so, I don't want to bleed into integration here Go too much, uh, but this, this, um, 
this interdependence among um, uh, infrastructures where, where we come together uh, with other um, institutions that are developing academy-owned infrastructure, uh, open infrastructure, to um, leverage the best points of each of those systems to come together and be something a little greater. Uh, I don't know if folks have read the, the Meta Archive statement on the, um, on the Deep in Sunset uh, today, um, but they made the point that the um, work that was done um, to set policy and governance of the community was far, far more benefit really than the work that was done uh, on the, the network or system itself. And that that work allows for healthy and sustainable community. And, uh, and so this sort of interdependence among a network of institutions who recognize the value in each other's projects and who, who work for each other's uh, best interest. You know, we, we would like to see Fulcrum and Editoria succeed and, and, and be sustainable and do, uh, do fairly well because that's good for us and good for them, that there's a win-win feeling about it. And, and that those infrastructures, uh, it, we need to be cognizant <coughs> that the, the community development is as important as the infrastructure development so that we have a, a sustainable future. Sustainable as was defined in the, the Athenaeum uh, 21 presentation as having a sense of continuity, uh, continuity of access, uh, as opposed to simply being you know, sort of uh, persisting uh, in a state. <laughs> I don't know if that was clear, that's my thought on that. Yeah, and that is a great segue into the last the last question prompt here, which is that um, I think one of the things that has been at times frustrating for the library publishing field is that there are so many new platforms in development in addition to the, the great platforms that we already have, like, like PKP software. Um, so understanding what's out there, choosing which one is right for you um, has, been, has been a challenge. Um, so it's been exciting to see the kinds of integration work that you all are doing. And I know you've talked a little bit about it, but um, you want to tell us a little bit more about the ways that you're building links between systems or sort of coordinating between them? So one of the really interesting um, sort of communities that has been introduced by working together on software has been the Michigan Digital Publishing X group, MDPX. So on Thursday, uh, Joshua, I, and Kathleen Fitzpatrick will all be at Michigan State University. So we go from university to university to eat each other's food, uh, and have been since, uh, which is really quite good, um, uh, uh, and have been since l l last year. And the way we started doing this was thinking about um, interoperability between our different systems. And that's been a very um, interesting experience because it's, we've had to have those meals together and we've actually had to have people in the room who really think about culture as well as software to establish a layer of trust and a layer of um, openness to really thinking uh, about our shortfalls as well as our strengths. Um, so that's, that's just been a really interesting experience in terms of what this kind of collaboration, working together in the community might actually feel like, which is not just about technology. And I'm looking forward to the food that you'll provide. <laughs> <laughs> Catherine, you want to say um, yeah, well, I think I might focus on Editoria itself as a thing because it is very much um, uh, built with the notion that it would plug into any number of front ends. Um, obviously, uh, you saw before on the workflow that um, Charles shared that it can be a book production system that would drive you know, you know content into Fulcrum. It could also sit behind any IR platform or a publishing platform. It, it isn't meant to be a solution unto itself. It's meant to be a cog in a machine. And so it is very much dependent on and eager for the success of the other pieces. Um, I mentioned briefly uh, when I was describing it that it was, it isn't, it's not built in a single um, code environment. I mean, there is the pub suite code and that is an important piece of it, but it, it adheres very closely to this ethos of sharing around open source projects. And so 
um, you know, a lot of what happens, the ingest engine, some of the, um, some of the, uh, the formatting and the um, typesetting um, is happening in systems that were not built by the Cocoa folks, and, but, but play well with, with their technology. And so I think that that is an important form of integration in the very conception of a project. Is it something that you need to build from you know, soup to nuts, or is it something that can draw on some of the successes and the resources that are already out in the community? And that has been both exciting and terrifying, of course, because then you don't control everything, and that's, that's one of the, the perils of this kind of model. But you have so much more um, in terms of possibility. You have resources, you have excitement, enthusiasm, and, and, and vision coming from any number of places, and it doesn't all reside with a single shop. So that's been um, a very positive uh, experience. Um, uh, I, I, I stole the MDPX. No, no, that's good. I'm glad you did. I, I, I think the MDPX, the X stands for collaboration, is an exciting development. And I, 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 yeah. I thought so it was I got exchange. a little piece in there. Yes. I thought it was exchange. Maybe it's exchange. Okay. <laughs> uh, stands for something. Uh, I think it's an exciting development, uh, partly because it it opens us up to each other. In I think in ways that maybe weren't possible before, yeah. and it allows us to think, as I said before, about like, our our partner's best good. You know, which is uh, there's a, that's there's something there. And I, I'm especially interested in the future of that because there are lots of there are lots of let's think in my own frame in Michigan. There's lots of institutions in Michigan that are tiny, you know. There's or smaller. There's Grand Valley and Northern Michigan and Central Michigan and even smaller, you know, colleges. And some of my colleagues there will, will you know, sort of very frankly say to me, in, uh, "That's good for the R ones, but what about?" us small library publishers who just, you know, we just don't have a plate, you know, we can't download your, your massive software and install it. And so the more we, um, the more we begin collaborating together on these kinds of projects, the wider the door may be for those institutions that don't have that kind of underpinning. And the more we will have changed our own approach to each other such that we might be able to welcome them into what we're doing. And I really look forward to that. I think that that's maybe one of the, the, the true positive outcomes. If this truly is a change of culture and integration and accessibility, that it would be an inclusive one for sort of all of our institutional brethren, brothers and sisters uh, across the landscape. <coughs> I think that's where a partner like Lyricist could also be an interesting piece because just because it's an open source platform doesn't mean that it has to be run locally. Some of us want to do that. Others of us would like to just have somebody, um, you know, make it available to us and we pay them a fee and license fee and, and, we, and we use it. And I think that, you know, recognizing that open source is not a, a place running open source, contributing code to open source is not a place where everyone can engage comfortably has the resources to do that, but that doesn't mean that they don't support it in some form, um, is a really important step forward for our community. And, and having sustainable service providers, um, and many of them, is also really, really important. I, I do want to say that I think the fact there, there is a, you know, we, we, our institution reeled a little bit from the B Press acquisition for all the reasons that you are aware of, that it, it felt like a betrayal, it seemed like an enclosure from the commercial space of, um, of a, a player that we thought was in our, in our wheelhouse. And so there is a, there's also a sense that these developments happening at academic institutions and staying at, there to the extent that that there's a, a foundation there, maybe a hedge against this enclosure, this idea of enclosure, that we're, that we're playing with each other, uh, you know, in this in this space. I don't know. There's a there's a it's kind of it's that uh, axiom that you don't do the same thing over and over and expect different results. Uh, if we can if we can begin to change the way that we collaborate together, uh, then then perhaps hosting becomes safe again. So they not increase in that space. Well, I want to make sure to leave time for questions. So I think we'll wrap up our prepared remarks here. Thank you very much, panelists.